Good evening. It is 7 p.m. on Monday, June 27th, 2022, and I call to order this regular meeting of the Richfield School Board. Attending this evening's board meeting live in the boardroom are board members Eric Carter, Rachel Banks Cupcho, Allegra Smishak, Paula Cole, Crystal Brocky, and I am board chair Tim Paulus. We are joined at the table by Superintendent Yunowski. It is, and there are other members of the district's administrative team present to share and give comments with us throughout the meeting. We're also joined at the table tonight, special guest, Laura Otterness, board secretary. Thanks to everyone joining us live here in the boardroom and also a warm welcome to those watching us on the live stream or on a delay on YouTube. Thanks for being with us. With that, our first item of business this evening is to approve the agenda before us. Um, it's a routine business item. I'll, I'll pause for a moment and see if anyone has anything they'd like to, to remove or add. But if I see or hear none, we could entertain a motion to approve it. I'll move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. We have a motion to approve by Ms. Smishek and a second by Ms. Cole. Any final discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The chair votes aye, and the agenda is approved. All right, that brings us to information and proposals, non-action items. And first up, as this is the second meeting of the month, it is a meeting in which we have public comment, and we do have someone who has signed up for, to, to share public comment. We have Ryan Wiskirchen, who's joining us this evening. And while Ryan is, is taking his, his spot at the table and getting set with the microphone, I have some, some notes to read. Uh, just to, to, as that we use to guide us through public comments. It's information for the speaker as well as for the community to understand. Um, thank you for coming tonight and sharing your comments with us. Um, while we will likely will not engage with, with you while you're giving comment, it is possible that board members or administrators will follow up with you afterwards. Um, thank you for sharing your comments. And while we're expressing gratitude, thank you for, for being willing to follow the guidelines in Policy 216 and Guideline 216.1. In brief, I will highlight the following from those documents. The time allotted is three minutes per speaker with an additional three minutes allocated if interpretation is needed. Laura will monitor the time. She will hold up a 30 second warning sign when 30 seconds remains. Any time's up warning at three minutes. At the conclusion of three minutes, if you have not wrapped up, you may, you know, I, I politely ask that you, you find a way to wrap up quickly so that we can get on with the rest of our meeting. There are not other speakers tonight, but we do have time limits. Um, we recognize one speaker at a time, so if there are those in attendance, uh, please give that speaker the full time without interruption. We ask that you not include names of Richfield Public School employees, their titles or locations if you're airing grievances or complaint. Um, something that could identify a staff member. To be clear, you know, that's for your protection as well as, as the board itself, as, as the employees have rights of privacy. If you slip on this, I may use the gavel and, and remind you of, of, of that rule. If you continue to slip, I may have to rule you out of order. And, and, and the comments. Um, if you have comments and praise of a staff member, of course, please feel free. If, that said, if you have issues related to the malperformance of a district employee, those should be made in writing into the Human Resources Department so they can be properly followed up on. We trust you understand personal attacks will not be allowed. And with that, we move to Mr. Wiskirchen, who is joining us tonight. Thank you for being here. We can. Is that uh, mic on? We can hear you fine. I believe I will ask uh, someone make sure your mic is on. It, you, we hear you fine. It's more for the the okay. online folks. Should be good. All right. I was a theater student, so I know how microphones okay. go. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm Ryan Wiskirchen. I am the Republican endorsed candidate for uh, Minnesota State House seat 51A, representing Richfield. Um, and I just want to start off by saying thank you very much, Chair Hollis, for pronouncing my last name. Uh, in an exemplary fashion. Um, it's one of those German last names that a lot of people trip over. Um, in short, I'm running because I want to be an advocate for Richfield and St. Paul. I work in St. Paul currently as a legislative staffer in the House of Representatives, so I know how things work, I know how bills get made or don't get made, and I know the valuable work that's done for constituents. Um, over the coronavirus pandemic, we have seen a lot of people reaching out for help reaching out for help with state agencies, with making ends meet, with just wanting to talk with someone on the phone. Um, and it's been my privilege and my pleasure to be that person um, helping guide people through state agencies. And I want to do that for my home community. Um, my wife is a teacher by training. 
and she taught has taught in Edina, uh, Davenport, Iowa, um, and is looking to get back into it as soon as our boys, aged two years and eight months, are a little more self-reliant. Um, and my sister is also a teacher in the Minneapolis Public Schools, of which I am a proud uh, product of. So I had the opportunity to see education issues from a lot of different perspectives as a student, um, now as a young parent, and as the uh, spouse of an educator. And it's been very um, enlightening for me to see what's going on more and more behind the scenes and how um, we all have a shared interest in seeing our children succeed academically and that it really is something that um, a lot of times people groups get pitted against each other when really that common goal is underlying everything. So my, um, if elected, my goal would be to work very closely with this body and other representatives of Richfield to make sure that our community's voice is heard in St. Paul. And a big push that I would like to see um, with the state's education policy is a return to more local control. Um, the one thing that I've been hearing from my wife and from my sister has been um, a lot of the things being passed in St. Paul are being passed on to teachers, new roles, new responsibilities that aren't taking into account the limited amount of time in a teacher's day and the compensation that teachers receive. And I want to be able to um, give us the opportunity to do what be works best for our community and to make sure that we're hitting the funding and the capabilities to continue the great work that uh, Richfield Public Schools is doing for its students. Um, if you need my contact information, uh, Superintendent Unowski and Chair Hollis both have it. And thank you very much for having me speak tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for coming. All right. That was our one and only uh, public commenter. And so thank you again to uh, Mr. Viscochi for joining us. Good thank night. you. Have a good night. And that brings us then to the superintendent update. All right, so we have three, three presentations for you tonight. Um, I will be calling to the microphone, uh, Director of Facilities Dan Kretzinger and Health and Safety Coordinator Dan Holcomb, um, who will be presenting on health and safety and an update on the year. Um, and then I will transition into a district report um, on vision cards and then also superintendent goals. So with that, we will turn it over to the two Dans to get us started. Great, thank you very much and good evening. Um, we're here to provide an update um, to the district on um, health and safety, uh, both what we have accomplished in the past year and what we're looking to do in the future. And so I'm gonna to introduce to you Daniel Holcomb. Uh, Mr. Holcomb is, um, works with IEA and they are partners with us. And I, I just wanna say how much I appreciate their partnership. Um, this is, there are a lot of things to cover uh, with health and safety from OSHA requirements to indoor air quality reports and investigations. So um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Holcomb to uh, give us the update. All right, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure working with Dan, Craig, and the district uh, for four plus years now. Um, and IEA as a whole, probably around 15 years. Um, so the task today we're gonna be discussing uh, was like Dan said, what we accomplished this past school year. Um, also projects overview, um, bigger projects such as radon, lead and water, um, and bigger things like that. Uh, turf field management, uh, we do provide uh, testing as well as inspections of the turf field. Uh, mock ocean inspection, that's an annual thing that we do. This past year we did, uh, we did complete this with Luke Salmon with SFM, your work comp insurer. Um, and then also discussing the projects that we have scheduled for this next school year. All right, for the tasks that we accomplished this past year was the health and services respirator program. Um, this was required based off of the OSHA ETS emergency, emergency temporary standard. Um, and they were required to wear N95 respirators while they were um, in the presence of potentially positive uh, COVID-19 students and staff. Um, so we had to do fit tests, create a program, and do medical evaluations with them uh, in order for them to properly wear their N95s. We also did get a grant approved. Dan got a grant approved for a new uh, snow removal piece of equipment. Uh, I think it was a Toro, 
Toro piece of equipment for uh, snow removal, um, and they provide a grant to assist us with purchasing that. Uh, we also did recently do a, a high school staircase fall protection project um, with construction that was done at the high school. Uh, we did have some fall protection issues um, getting onto a certain part of the roof uh, for them to be doing some air filter changes. So we did have a staircase that was um, installed in two different locations recently. Uh, we did do training with some new district staff. Uh, we do have a new chemical hygiene officer at the high school. Um, so that did kind of involve with additional training on OSHA and proper, proper disposal and labeling and all that. Um, then also exposure control officer for the district. Um, this was a new one with, uh, with the change from Phoebe. Um, we had to do some training on with that employee as well as uh, properly getting them on board with the district's exposure control plan. Uh, we did have a uh, UST, an underground storage tank removal at Central. Um, this is just uh, taking out the tank so there's no potential for leaks of fuel oil. And also this reduces the cost of the district to um, have an active um, fee uh, for MPCA for having that be active. We still do have USTs at the high school, middle school, STEM, and the bus garage. But those are needed for, for backup in the event of any sort of... Uh, um, weather changes, so we, need, we do need to have that fuel oil and gasoline um, on hand uh, in case for that. Um, then also we did a machine guarding assessment. We completed that this past summer uh, at the wood shop, metal shops at the high school and middle schools uh, to ensure that we have proper guarding for students and staff, um, and then also any sort of action items in regards to how to properly maintain those and prevent employees from getting exposure to um, blades and whatnot. We did do transportation, fa transportation and facilities first aid and CPR training uh, that was done by the community ed. We did have 20 participants that, did, uh, that were involved with that. Uh, we did create a file sharing system with Dan's uh, building leads and maintenance staff uh, to help communicate various things with them so they can pass it on to their um, other staff as well. And then the annual trainings for OSHA uh, through Safe Schools um, electronic lear learning management system. Uh, so we can have all the uh, correct staff get the proper training that's required according to OSHA. So for projects overview, uh, this is more for like radon, uh, lead, and water. Uh, we, do, we do this every five years. Radon is up in 2024, 2025. We do all district buildings um, at one time for radon. Same thing with lead and water. This is due up in 2023 and 2024. Uh, we do bleacher inspections every five years. Uh, it's, it's required to be certified by a professional engineer. This will be done this summer in July. Uh, we do turf field testing every two years. Uh, we do uh, this, it's GMAX testing to measure the hardness of the turf field to ensure that, that, that uh, students and staff aren't going to be getting concussions if they're out there on the field for PE or for sports. Uh, we also have another slide on uh, turf field uh, management as well. And then also indoor air quality testing. We do this every year. And this past year, we did 618 rooms uh, at nine different lo building locations. And we're looking for any moisture concerns, uh, temperature, CO, CO2 levels, um, and just looking for anything that could be a hazard. And we also do uh, send out a staff survey so they can provide any sort of concerns that they do have beforehand. So we do have their concerns with us while we're uh, going out there to the rooms and looking for any sort of concerns. All right, so for the turf field management, uh, Dan staff uh, does uh, conduct their own maintenance, sweeping and grooming. And then recently, Dan has been having turf fix, uh, a maintenance company come out and they do some uh, additional maintenance, such as increasing infill, uh, power brushing and vacuuming, magnetic sweeping, and also additional grooming. Uh, the goal is to improve player safety. Uh, and then IEA also comes out and does that, does that GMAX testing to ensure that it's a safe level for, for, uh, for uh, students to be using it. Um, and in May, 20, May 2020, uh, we did testing and it was at, at the proper levels. Turfix did also did their own GMAX testing after their maintenance and it was below levels as well. Um, and then Dan does have, or the, it is uh, scheduled to have the turf field replaced in the summer of 2023. Um, and IEA will provide testing as well in July and August of this summer um, just to ensure that this last year is going to be safe for the, for the uh, uh, students to be uh, on the field. 
So we did the mock ocean inspection in March. Uh, we did the high school and bus garage with Dan Kretzinger, Luke Salmon with SFM, and the building uh, lead as well. Uh, so one thing that we've been seeing commonly is the garbage disposal guards have been removed post renovations or with just staff that don't like them because it's hard to get stuff down the drain. We have looped in the food service director as well to have him be looking through this, looking at this whenever he's at his sites uh to make sure that he's accountable as well it's not just his staff but he needs to be looking for this as well it's not just mine and dan's responsibility to point it out every time we see it um, also a missing cover uh drain in the uh, high school boiler room this could have been post uh post renovation it could have been missed um, so we did have the, a drain cover put on there to prevent any sort of trip hazards uh, extension cords being used as permanent wiring um, using extension cords to extension cords to make it be a longer cord. We just need to be using uh, more, more outlets or having a power strip that's properly rated um, using that in the, in the areas. So we do have Laco Tagout that's missing on some of the new uh, boiler, boiler equipment, HVAC equipment that is being uh, updated in July of this year as well. Uh, we did have a hoist in the bus garage that we couldn't verify the support load for it. So right now that is not being operable in the bus garage until Dan and myself have a engineer look at that to ensure that it is rated for the uh, drums that it is lifting. Um, it is oil drums that, they're, that they are using it for. Uh, blocked, blocked electrical core, or electrical panels, um, it's required to have it be three feet in front. Um, yes, it is a, uh, a cart that is on wheels, but still you wanna have that be accessible in the event of an emergency. Uh, you wanna be able to access, access that right away. And then chemical containers were not labeled properly. Um, this was in the bus garage as well. Uh, we did discuss this with Dan, with Dan McGinn, the uh, bus mechanic. Uh, we need to have proper chemical names and hazards on those, uh, on those containers to ensure that employees know what the hazards are for the chemicals they're using. So co going to the uh, projects for this upcoming year, uh, we do have quite a bit actually occurring this summer. We do have a rooftop fall protection and ladder inspections that are getting done in July. This will be looking at any new air handling units as well as new ladders um, and, and old ladders at all district buildings to ensure that they are properly um, up, to, up to code for OSHA as well as we're not going to be exposing any of our employees to fall hazards on the rooftop with any new AH, AHU units that are, that are up there. Lock Otago program updates. Uh, we will be having uh, a procedures done for all equipment that does have more than one energy source. And this is required by OSHA because in the event that you do have any sort of maintenance that needs to be done on a machine, you want to have all the machines be shut off properly so there's no unexpected energy startup when maintenance is being done inside the machine. Confined space program updates. With the new building uh, upgrades, we are, we are gonna have some additional confined spaces or removal of old confined spaces. And these are gonna be areas that are gonna be, have limited means for entry and exit. It is not meant for continuous occupancy uh, and it's large enough to perform work. So such as a boiler, a tunnel, there are hazards that are involved with that and we need to have those listed out and how to properly enter the space if there's gonna be some work done in that space. Bleacher inspections, like we said, every five years, that'll be done in July and August as well. Turf field uh, GMAX testing, that'll be done in July and August by, by myself. And then in the fall, we'll be doing district-wide noise monitoring for all staff groups that are exposed to high noise. We wanna make sure that every staff member is below OSHA levels. And if they are above, then we wanna have some corrective actions in place such as PPE or noise dampering uh, tools, equipment, barriers. Uh, just to ensure that anyone that's, that's uh, you know, working in the school day, they're not going to be exposed to anything that could be damaging to their hearing. Any questions from myself or Dan? All right, thank you for sharing that. I, I'll turn to the board now. I'm going to start with Ms. Meshek, if I could. See if you have questions for the Dans. <laughs> um, I was curious what chemical hygiene was, but I think I got it after seeing the, the pictures. Um, so I actually really appreciated those pictures for the mock OSHA inspection. It kind of explains the kinds of things you might find and it is a testament to your thoroughness. So thank you. Um, but I don't have any other questions. Just thank you for your presentation. Ms. Banks, you up, Joe. I don't have any questions, but my goodness, there's so many things that I was not even thinking about <laughs> in terms of running this operation. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carter. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Uh, just one question. 
Um, you know, for the mock, uh, the mock inspection, I'm assuming that you guys are correcting things thereafter. And then the question is, is do you set a time frame for how fast they need to be corrected? So I, we, we do create a spreadsheet that we share with with each person. Uh, some stuff can get corrected as soon as possible before the inspection is even, even done. Uh, we do have a few action items still out there. Dan and myself haven't been able to meet as much recently. Um, but that is one thing that's on our agenda is to get those completed. Um, like the lock tag out that is that's estimated to be completed in July and August time frame. Um, but the the more high hazard items such as you know even like a drain cover or chemical labeling, uh, you don't want anyone to be using any sort of containers that they, they don't know what it is. That can get addressed pretty much right away with the assistance of myself and Dan and with the affected employees. Yeah, I would just say too, there are some things that we're still we're waiting on product for some of the um, uh, drain covers and things like that. Um, not drain covers, but for the um, uh, what am I thinking of the food disposers and things oh, like yeah. that. Um, sometimes they can take a while to get. Just they make them custom for our products, so um, they can take a little while. Sure. Well, thanks for keeping us safe. Thanks. Ms. Brocky, questions or comments? Uh, I would just uh, echo the appreciation for the photos. I think they're so helpful in illustrating the work that happens um, and how you all really keep an eye on things, as, as Eric said, to, to keep all of us and to keep our buildings safe. So I look forward to the presentation every year. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Ms. Cole, questions or comments? Uh, thank you for, the pres for everything that you include and the details. Uh, I find that every time I understand more and more <laughs> the vocabulary, uh, like hoist after <laughs> something I learned about uh, my basement remodel uh, <laughs> and YouTube. Um, I have um, a question about any existing procedures for employees to report some of these things before you do the mock inspection. So like is uh, maybe like is there like a or, or are we hoping to have a culture when someone, you know, sees something can report it and then it can be addressed uh, in a, you know, before that? Um, and if there is a procedure, then like how, how, how do you manage a response to, you know, like and prioritize, like where do you go next to see? Uh, I'm curious to know like how that works because I know like the power strips, like I'm, I'm thinking about the one under my desk at home that is like pretty and green and <laughs> silver, but I'm like, is it safe? So thank you for bringing all of that <laughs> to my attention. Uh, keeping it real as usual. <laughs> and so, yeah, so curious to know about the, the standard procedures for uh, reporting. So we do have a couple, we do have a safety, safety suggestion form that's on the district website and also a, a health and safety email um, that we do send out to uh, all staff in the fall um, to let them know that if they do have any concerns, they can address it to either of those two things. Uh, myself, as well as Dan, uh, Craig, and I think a couple others may have access to that email. So we get notified of anything that gets brought up right away. Um, and then the same thing as the safety suggestion form, I believe it does. It goes to uh, Dan, um, but we can address that right away. Dan also does have a, uh, uh, is it a PM or what's the uh, reporting for your staff too as well? Yeah, it's a, it's a help desk type of a mm -hmm. uh, device that people can, can put in and uh, request for assistance on something. Mm -hmm. um, I would say too, like for mock OSHA inspections, um, it's more of an education for our staff mm -hmm. so that um, we don't announce when we're coming. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll come through and start just looking at things and we'll bring our staff members in and say, hey, can you tell me about this? Um, how, how is that supposed to function? What can we do to assist you in, in, in making this easier for you? Um, so that's more what that's about. So if um, OSHA does come in, they're far less about um, instruction training. and more about fining yeah. right and so um so we want to be as ready as we can be and we want the district to be as ready as we can be when they do decide to stop and it's usually not a matter of if they'll come by it's a matter of when so that's that's what our goal is with the ocean inspections thank you all right thank you i i 
echo everyone's everyone's um, comments of appreciation. I, I do learn something in this presentation every year. And one of the things I've learned is, is that extension cords used as permanent wiring is, is perhaps the most common <laughs> flaw that we have as, as humans who use elect electricity. So, Yeah, it, according to OSHA, it's allowed for up to 90 days for temporary wiring. So you may see that if you do have any sort of uh, Christmas lights or something in a classroom or somewhere. Um, but 90 days is the max for that to be used. It needs to be taken out uh, within that time frame. So. Well, I have no other questions. Last call for questions or comments. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well done, Dan and Dan. Um, now we have um, Vision Card One presentation or Vision Card Part One, um, and so we are beginning with an end of year update on activities, business and operations, and community and or communication and marketing. And so just as a reminder, because um, we do these a couple of times a year, um, and we continue to get baseline data, they're a way of reporting our progress as a public accountability system. Um, we also use them internally and externally to remain focused on our top priorities. So our vision cards align to our overall strategic plan, and they have more measures um, than we typically use. We have one for each of the strategic plan strategies. And so just as a reminder, as we've launched um, and gone with our strategic plan, um, our major strategies are in academics, activities, business and ops, climate and culture, and communication and marketing. Um, and in each of those areas, um, there are statements that define what we are trying to accomplish uh, with some sub-activities to really make sure that we are, as a district, um, aligning our activities and actions to the overall strategies and our overall strategic plan. Uh, each vision card has three pages, um, and at the back of the presentation is all of the, all of the pages in their entirety. Um, there's an overall of our or an overview of our current status, um, sort of that progress report, um, a list of the key actions we have implemented over the course of this year, so more of that uh, subjective information that we have tried to move ourselves through, and then also uh, the data, uh, the rubric for assessing progress um, on each measure. So again. They're included in the board packet. Uh, we also have them published on our website. And so if you go to our strategic plan, richfieldschools.org, about strategic plan, uh, you can see them uh, published in their entirety. <coughs> um, understanding them and how we are choosing to report them here. Um, each progress report shows the measurements that we're using uh, with updated data um, using red text rather than black text. Uh, some measures reported on the mid-year update and some are at the end of the year. Um, and then baseline is by the level zero, or where that fancy little R is in the center of, of the bar. Um, and then only new updated data for measures noted is used to determine our progress, uh, because those are the things we have been moving forward. Um, and then just as an overall systemic reminder, these are not the only measures we evaluate our progress. These are just some of the larger measures that we use to, to look at things. Uh, we also um, look at both broad data, but then also break it down into demographic groups. And sometimes there is no gap, but sometimes there are gaps. And so we look at them in both categories, but sometimes there are not goals. So for example, last year there was no gap um, between students in graduation rate. And so retaining that uh, lack of a gap would be where we would want to go, and we would not set specific goals to, to continue to improve. A uh, strategic uh, plan created vision for some areas that have never been measured in the past. So some of our areas just don't have measures and we are grabbing baseline data and also learning where we have not historically gathered data in the past. Um, we also sometimes, because of COVID, have used baseline data across different years because the, um, the pandemic has created some, some unique uh, measurement abilities or inabilities. Um, and then there are already areas where as a district, we are already at where we would like to be or very closely there. Um, and so there's also areas where we're not necessarily expecting improvement. We just want to maintain where we are. Um, and so just as a reminder, this is what the vision cards look like. Um, and so each of these are the actions we do um, or the activities within each strategy. So these are the activities. Uh, we'll provide more variety of activity programs. Um, there is not a new measure. Um, then, looking at student participation, you'll note there are four new measures, including increasing the number of students participating at elementary, middle, and high, um, and then also ensuring that our demographics align with the overall demographics of our school district. Um, and then we're also looking to increase the number of people in attendance at games um, and performances, something we have not historically tracked, and so we're beginning to track that data and that information. Page two, um, and I won't read through all of the activities, 
or all of the things that we have done um, in terms of our key actions, just a couple. Um, as we look to expand participation, we're doing things in after school and summer school um, to expand our partners and expand participation. Um, and then also, obviously, we um, have expanded with the Director of Extended Learning as ESSER funds have provided funds specifically tied to expanding offerings after school. And so we have two years of government COVID funds to really look at expanding offerings after school and expanding offerings in summer school. So some of the, some of the actions we have taken. Um, our progress, you'll note there are some areas of success um, and some areas where we want to continue to focus. Uh, next slide. Um, increasing the number of students participating at the elementary level. We were highly successful um, looking at 1,076 students in elementary participating, an increase of 280 students from the 1920 school year. At the same time, middle school saw a small decrease of 98 students, um, not overall success. Um, and you'll note that green is areas that we feel the data showed success, um, just to highlight. Red were areas where the data did not show what we wanted. Um, an increase of 14 students participating at the high school. However, we also noticed um, that there was a significant gap, and that gap actually grew by 2%. The percent of students who were BIPOC participating in activities, 49%, uh, a gap of 22%, because over 71% of our students are BIPOC students. And so we would anticipate 71% of our participants would be BIPOC students. Uh, one of the things we've talked about as a board and something for us to come back to um, as we think about data that had shown itself in the past and something for the board to reflect on further, which I think you already are, is whether we want to do something in relation to fees um, for our students. Because what we noticed is fees had created a barrier for some of our students, um, and fees had created a barrier that had a differing impact um, depending on the race of students. And so um, we are not necessarily meeting our equity vision in terms of how we are distributing um, distributing fees across our entire community and it's changing clearly as we see in our vision card participation and something for us to, to further look at. Uh, next in the progress report is our business and operations. Um, so maintaining staff, um, looking at new numbers and decreasing the number of staff members voluntarily leaving RPS um, and then also increasing the RPS staff hires who are black, indigenous and or people of color. Um, continuously improving facilities and as we've been continuing to work, decrease the magnitude of unmet facility needs. Uh, you'll see some other areas on the next page um, where we also have new data, increasing the percentage of students uh, participating in meals, improving audit practices, increasing the investment in technology in the hands of students and teachers, um, and then also increasing the students receiving district transportation or safe routes to schools. Um, we have continued on with a wide range of actions in these areas, um, including diverse hiring fairs, um, adding solar panels, uh, signing the Food Forward Pledge in nutrition, um, and then also continuing uh, grant funding and things like safe routes to schools. And again, I'm not planning to read all of those, I'm just hitting some of the highlights. Um, overall, um, you'll see a decrease um, of the number of staff who have left. Um, 2021 was a larger than, than typical year with 141 staff members leaving voluntarily. This past year, 81. Um, so there was improvement in that area. Um, also, um, an area where we continue to improve um, is hiring and retaining staff of color. 31% uh, of new hires were BIPOC, um, and that is 7% higher than the 24% um, of our over, overall staff numbers, which continue to grow. Uh, decreasing the magnitude of unmet facility needs um, as we continue on with that long-term facility maintenance budget um, and as we continue with construction those needs will continue hopefully um, to shrink um, and then another area to specifically highlight um, we had um, increasing the percentage of students receiving district transportation obviously as we know at the start of this year we made significant transportation changes after COVID um, and so this will be an important data number to continue to track um, as we look at similar rules uh, for transportation as we move forward next year. Um, and then finally, the third vision card to look at is around communication and marketing. And you'll see a wide range. Um, we actually have new data in all of these areas uh, because these have been the goals in transportation for a couple of years. And so uh, looking at increasing connection, uh, reporting positive communication um, and effective communication, increasing positive news and community engagement. Uh, website traffic, and then also enrollment market share. Um, we have done uh, a wide range of communications activities um, and also implemented a new survey methodology using Qualtrics, which also um, at our last meeting showed that we had the highest participation um, in a survey and 
Um, well, we still need to close the gap further in demographic representation is about half the survey respondents um, or approaching half of the survey respondents were uh, community members of color. Um, we also need to to move up more in the 71% range uh, similar to our overall demographics. Uh, progress, we had a lot of positive outcomes. Um, based on our survey, we had a higher percentage connection um, of two students' teachers, um, a higher percentage of families suggesting that our district communication is effective. Um, also, positive news stories increased, community engagement with social media increased. Um, it did not, however, over the short term, have a change in market share. Uh, we had a small one point drop, as noted in red, in terms of overall market share of students living in Richfield choosing to enroll in Richfield Public Schools. At our next meeting, we'll present the other two cards, climate and culture and academics. Um, we did not have the ability to present those today because data showed up until the very end of school. Uh, so we're presenting these three today, um, and we'll present the other two on July 11th. So with that, I'll pause and turn it back to Tim for questions or comments. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll move first to the left then and, and see if Ms. Cole wants to chime in first with questions or comments on vision cards. Thank you. Very informative. All right. Very thorough. Ms. Brackey, questions or comments? Um, I think this just gets clearer every time as far as how information is presented and the accessibility of it. Um, and I think the, the thing that I just wanted to appreciate and celebrate are the successes around staff hiring and retention. Um, because when I think about setting us up for a stronger school year in 2022, 2023, I feel like that is the greatest lever that we have. Um, and so I was really excited to see those uh, outcomes in particular. That's it. All right. Mr. Carter, questions or comments? Yes, <laughs> always. Uh, thank you for this. It, always so much data and just try not to, to get lost while you're talking. Um, <clears throat> so back in the activities section, uh, Ensure demographic students participating in activities aligned with overall demographics or RPS. A gap, the gap increased 2%. Yes. Um, and that's across all activities? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and uh, do we have all the surveys? But I mean, I know you know, we just had the student surveys about participation. Do we get any feedback about like why people are participating? I mean, other than, I know you mentioned cost, right? And we're gonna address that. Right. Um, we, well, uh, we aren't 100% sure. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously with, with us starting this year in COVID, it, um, it was a challenge to get some of the activities launched. Uh, clubs were a little bit slower to get launched. Um, it was, our, our partnership at elementary um, expanded. Um, and so there were more opportunities with Beacons um, showing up in the elementary um, and, and a wider range of opportunities. Um, we are also offering an expanded summer school with enrichment opportunities that, that creates additional activities. Um, we are looking at the middle school, but as we've talked about, it was a very challenging year at our middle school. Um, and so um, continuing to focus on improving systemically our middle school is one of those components. Um, and then um, if you do look then, high school matched or went up slightly. And so thinking about then demographically, there was a small change. Um, and so we do have evidence based on our previous survey that um, finance and our communication around scholarships and sliding fees is, is something that needs to be improved. Um, and a conversation that this board has already begun to engage in. Um, back in the day, and I guess this is probably pre-COVID, I'm trying to think, you know, we had like, um, like activities like an activities fair, mm -hmm. are, are we still doing that? I mean, it's. Um, I just think of you know of you and I talking years ago, kind of over at the band shell, mm -hmm. right? It's like, are, are we still doing that, or is that kind of on hold because of COVID, or is it just beginning of the year? And then maybe I guess the follow up, so kind of two part question of like, do we do it any mid year? Because I think of like our time back at STEM, and it's like how they'd have the movie night. Mm -hmm. You know, have we given thought to like, do we do little mini stations of how do we better communicate? Because people are coming in and participating. And it's like, I feel like, you know, as you start off in elementary school, you get so many participants, and then it just, it continues to trail off. And I get part of it is, is teenagers. Um, but, but, you know, it's like, it's the families too. Right. So 
to be fair, our buildings were closed to outside visitors until April or May this year. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the activities that we were able to welcome families, which we just, I mean, the amount of excited family opportunities we had in the last month of school was amazing. Um, we are cautiously optimistic um, that we'll be able to begin to offer those types of opportunities. Um, we do have fairs and um, ex exploratory opportunities for our kids. Um, and so the kids are exposed to all the options that are out there, but COVID has definitely thrown barriers between our ability to do that with parents on site. And we are very hopeful that doesn't continue in the future. Um, thank you. And then I guess the next question is around the safe routes to school. 58% um, of the students participate. Uh, do we assess like how full the buses are? And, and I guess what I'm wondering is that, you know, I, I hear comments, people talk about like, well, if you're under two miles, you can't get a ride. And so then my question would be is that if we're not, if we're going further, but we're not getting participation, do we change our routes to go ahead and like, tr tr I mean, Richfield's not that big, mm -hmm. right? And so is it is it something that we're, as we're going, as we're going to the farther locations that we're putting kind of sub stops in? Just asking. So we have evolved our bus routes over the course of the year, um, but we are legally required to provide transportation uh, to a certain set of students and can't then fill a bus to capacity without saving them a spot. Okay. Um, and so a student who may ride two days a week but doesn't tell us or doesn't commit to which two days, we still have to have that seat for them and can't overstuff the bus um, with students in closer opportunities. Um, our biggest, I mean, some of our biggest challenges with regard to transportation, um, similar to other staffing areas, is drivers um, and having enough drivers to expand routes if we wanted to provide more transportation um, and also a place to house buses or an extra contractor if we wanted to do that. Um, as you think about the employment shortage, um, it's, it's hard for even subcontractors, it's hard for us to find additional drivers. Um, we have looked as a board, um, I believe about six years ago, um, to providing a more universal transportation. Um, it was, I believe, at that time, somewhere in the three hundred fifty to $400,000 a year um, to provide more transportation, um, which would be a conversation that we could have, um, but that would have to be a funding priority. Similar to, I began exploration on fees um, for activities which would be somewhere in the hundred to $150,000 range of what it would cost to pay for activities for every student who wanted to participate. Um, without being able to track it exactly at this time. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Ms. Banks, you have questions or comments? Um, thank you for always articulating this kind of information, which can be really dense um, in a very, you know, cohesive, understandable way. Um, I guess the only question I have is, don't you think you could have put more words on each of those slides? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, Next challenge. challenge. Smaller font. Could, I think, you know, as we talk about them in, we'll do it in the superintendent goal, right? We talk about process goals and then the actual data. Um, in the strategic plan, they're called key actions because we also want to talk about that the numbers don't always tell all of the inputs that are being put in. Um, and so it's important to know both the process um, and also the outcome, both of which are important. So, yeah. right. Ms. Meshack, questions, comments? Um, I had noticed the Director of Extended Learning position posted and was excited to see that. What I didn't know is that it was an ESSER funded position. So I just think it's really cool to see that connection between our strategic plan creating new positions to support that work and using our ESSER funding um, to really support our vision. So that was new information for me. Thank you. And um, Crystal was mentioning the to, the, to celebrate our um, diverse hiring this year. And you did mention in the presentation kind of recruitment fairs um, and connections with some local universities. And I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about that. Like, what do you think, what do you attribute that success to? Because a lot of districts attend those fairs and go to those universities. I mean, I can't tell you the secret. 
Um, <laughs> I think, I think with, and it's hard for me as a white male to to share um, what other people's perspectives are. I believe that we are a district that has strong leaders of color. I believe that we are a district that has a reputation of being a safe, effective place to work for people of color. Um, I think word of mouth, honestly, frankly, more than <laughs> more than um, going to a fair, uh, because everybody is at a fair, everybody is recruiting at a fair. Um, and so I, I think we are pretty well known as a place where people of color can come to work and have it be a respectful, supportive environment. Um, and I think it has begun to sell itself. Um, we used to host that at the U, that it was just us, and then the others started joining. Correct, I got, yes. Um, so J.B. Mayo, professor at the U, runs affinity groups at the U. We were the first ones to go partner host, and then he was expected to open it up to other school districts. Um, and so, yes, we, but when you're the first, it kind of sets out yes, yes, that expectation. Like Saturday, like I, yeah. Right, right. Very nice. I, I, are we not doing that because of COVID? That was so much fun. Uh, we actually did. Did he have one? I think he had one this year. Um, and I think they had cut it down. I think Dr. Daniels and I went. Said, yeah, I think they had cut it down to only having a very specific allowable representation. Uh, they wanted the superintendent. And frankly, um, I mean, I got told to bring Dr. Daniels. <laughs> 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 and then I asked her if she would go, and she was excited to go. Um, they wanted to see Dr. Daniels more than me. And so there's, there's a great example of we have strong leaders of color in our district. I mean, the woman has won Humanitarian of the, the Year Award from St. Thomas College. Um, and so, what? <laughs> I want to add that for, for uh, back to Daniels, uh, extend that inclusivity and the, the reputation to uh, LGBTQ+. Uh, I, I have friends who have mm -hmm. interviewed whose pronouns have been respected without a blink, you know, not a blink of an eye, mm -hmm. and this is not even like in the last few months, I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you know, a year or two. Uh, and I think when you have a leadership that is genuinely committed to equity, that really shows. Uh, and, 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 and it's very meaningful, uh, especially the climate and culture piece of the work, which is really where the staff retention uh, is at, and speaking of that, I wanna add that I would like to see those numbers about retention in comp because I know this is not just us. Mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's teachers are leaving the profession in, 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 in ways uh, for a lot of reasons, so I, I, you know, maybe for us to chat later about like how are we doing in comparison to other districts uh, and also their uh, retention. Uh, not today. Not today. Yeah, no, I, I <laughs> don't have that data today. Right, right. And I'm not, I'm trying to think of how to get that data. And, and I would agree with you. I think that we, and, and I think honestly it is led by this board. And this board sets a very clear vision of we're here about the students and we are here to provide everything that they need and support them, which means having staff that represent them. Um, and that means um, every possible demographic category and and folks that are often marginalized, frankly, in other places where they might work, uh, where they might go to school. Um, and it is part of what our vision as a district is, and it is part of what you have tasked, is create a create an environment where people uh, can thrive. Um, and so we have done that. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments on the vision cards? I just want to echo, I do I do find that they, they get more more readily understandable with each successive iteration and the summary of, of, of the information that feeds it is very helpful. So thank you. Absolutely. All right, with that, we'll move then to item three, superintendent goals presentation. All right, superintendent goals. So this is the final um, report on goals, um, those that were accomplished and that weren't. And this is one of the uh, parts of my evaluation. Um, the Evaluation process includes um, goals, um, survey of you all, and also my direct reports. Um, we'll be having a closed session on July 11th, um, and then following that up, uh, yes, July 11th, which is our next board meeting, 
Um, and then following that up with a report back from the chair about what occurred in the evaluation meeting, which would be at our meeting on August 1st. Um, and so just as a reminder, in terms of performance evaluation overall, um, just like QComp and our teachers, 35% around student achievement, um, process goals, kind of like those key actions, um, and then overall individual performance or um, your evaluation of, of me and how, how things are going overall. Uh, some of the specific goals that we set in regard to student achievement, um, increasing the number of students proficient on the fifth grade the teacher's college benchmark assessment by 5%. Ensure that the demographics align with the overall demographics of our school district, uh, continuing the grad rate growth and also doing that within each demographic group, uh, looking at NWEA map growth, 5% uh, from fall to winter, um, and then also um, on the NWEA map, closing the racial achievement gap from fall to winter by 5%. Um, so we have areas, again, of success, areas not so much. <laughs> Um, in terms of teachers' college benchmark reading, and this is our, our students reading at benchmark, 44% um, of our fifth graders moved in. We saw constant progress on this throughout the course of the year, um, ending at 57% of our fifth grade teachers. Um, and then also looking at demographics, we began the school year with a 12% gap, um, ended up at five in the middle, and then five at the end. And so we had significant growth and also significant closure of gaps. So that was a success, um, and our teachers' benchmark data shows. Um, an achieved goal. Um, at the same time, we see a partially achieved goal in regard to graduation rate. Um, RHS gained 1.3 points, um, RCEP gained 9 points, and Richfield overall um, gained about 1.5 points. Um, demographic groups um, gained 3 or more points, black, uh, African American, and also white. Um, other demographic groups increased, um, but by fewer than 3 points, Hispanic, Latino, uh, male, and female. Um, and then we also saw small reductions in graduation rate in Asian, two or more races, ELL, special ed, and free and reduced lunch. Um, and so you have the data chart to the right. Um, and so we had some areas of success, overall um, growth, um, but then also areas that we definitely need to continue to focus on and continue to improve on. Um, in the NWEA map, um, we, as we already outlined in our previous uh, meeting, um, at the mid-range, mid uh, we did not have success overall. Um, RPS students um, did not have um, the level of growth we would have wanted to see in regard to the NWEA map. Um, and then also, um, the gap stayed the same um, or um, had a slight closure from, uh, in reading from fall to winter. Um, but overall, um, not something I would look at as successful. So we would look at that as a not achieved goal um, and something for area of further focus. Uh, then as we look at some of the process goals we were focusing on, um, leading through the pandemic, focusing on the strategic plan, um, overall construction budget and work, equity policy and guidelines, standards-based grading, and radical hospitality um, and communications. Um, and so overall, um, RPS, 79% um, of our staff and 83% of parents suggest that we effectively led through the pandemic. Uh, creating those safe learning plans, maintaining protocols, continuing to have lower infection rates than there were outside of schools, um, and then continuing to realign to CDC guidelines. Uh, vision cards, obviously we did well there, as you saw presentation one today. Um, you'll see presentation two, and we'll finalize at the next. Um, we also published them at the start of the year um, and had that mid-year um, update as we continue to go with updated data. Um, our construction project continues to be a success, completed at all of our Regular sites, uh, nearly completed now on the maintenance and transportation building. We had strong budgeting and monitoring practice, and so we had continuing improvements expanded um, to things like the bus garage in Central beyond what we had initially um, expected, um, and also overall on time and overall within budget. So success there. Uh, equity guidelines. Um, we had the equity policy a year ago, April. Uh, guidelines drafted and brought to the board and approved, and obviously we will launch out in the fall um, with a full training of all our staff. Um, and then begin to really work on the expectations that go along with that as we keep as we keep working to train our staff and support our staff in both expectations, support, and obviously accountability. Uh, Standards-based grading, um, we've had appropriate progress. Uh, we did slow things down because of COVID and overall workload, uh, but digital gradebook was launched at the elementary for trimester two, and we provided PD um, before the start of the 21-22 school year. Uh, moving to synergy in a full or transition to the gradebook uh, for the 22-23 year. Um, and then we are working at standards-based grading in grade 6-12 um, and expect some pretty significant strides to be going next year. Um, and so we'll continue going in that direction. 
Um, and then communications and radical hospitality, and we will say this one is partially achieved. There were areas of very uh, significant success, and then obviously areas to significantly approve upon. Um, and so we had uh, 71 to 73 percent agreeing with um, some of our overall programs. Um, we signed the Fast Food Forward Pledge, the first one in the nation. Um, we were named a top workplace. Um, we are one of a small districts, uh, set of districts with COVID testing on site. Um, and then also maintained a health resource center. And obviously at the same time, we've had challenges that we've talked about that we really wish would have gone much more effectively. And so there are areas of pretty big success and then obviously areas that were not quite as good. Um, and then just a reminder about overall individual performance, um, spring, summer, um, today, then again on July, um, direct data from the parent and staff surveys, direct reports, board members, and then obviously we'll finalize that with the closed session evaluative process. So with that, I will stop and turn it over for questions or comments. All right, thank you. <coughs> so if we could, we'll start with Ms. Bracke on this one. Sure. Um, I don't really have any questions. Uh, I think, again, it's clear. Um, and we have the helpful updates along the way throughout the school year. Um, I, the one thing I wanted to say is that I think the timing of this is really helpful given that we have your evaluation at our next meeting. And so I just think like the, the timing of both the vision cards and then this presentation um, coming at the meeting immediately prior to us um, doing your evaluation um, and then being able to report out on that at our August meeting, I think is a really helpful flow um, that we should really stick to in the future that's it all right thank you we'll switch over to miss banks cup show i know i'm, oh. I'm, I'm a random number generator <laughs> on this one <laughs> be ready everyone be ready please i don't have anything thank you <laughs> miss cole uh, thank you for uh the data and detail appreciate the scene both the baseline and the progress uh, and the tables and uh, how it's divided by demographics in different ways so that it makes it really easy to analyze uh, prior to, to the meeting and hopefully for parents uh, and community members also accessing the, the work packet. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, it is very encouraging. All right, Ms. Misha. Um, doing a little math. Oh. Can you come back to me? I, I can. Mr. Carter. Oh my God, Mr. Carter like will buy you school. some time. That's what he's doing. Yeah, well, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, actually, I think I'll have one question. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, the, 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 the communication slide. Mm -hmm. um, what, what we said we partially, or your goal partially achieved what is what is the target number did it like there's so much data like, you could put a little bit more on here but i don't see <laughs> a goal number on here anywhere so i don't so with process goals we're not necessarily noting a specific bar or a specific these are the things that are going into that process so survey data suggests that parents um community community members and staff feel more positive than negative um, there are a number of pretty big successes um, but we don't have a here's the data that we're specifically shooting for in that area uh, that that isn't what we do with process goals or what we have not necessarily done it was a very family field response survey says <laughs> sorry <laughs> well it, in public tonight. yeah I'm, I'm, yet here we are yeah, right. uh, um i guess it i feel like the data speaks it speaks answers to, depending on what you want to see, mm -hmm. right? Um, if there, are and I'll be candid, if there are people who don't like you, they look and they go, these numbers, uh, I could see someone coming up to me going, Eric, do, these, do you think these numbers are good? Or do you think these numbers are representative from a leader who, whose primary job is to communicate are those good numbers? And, and so, well, but I'm, I'm trying to, like, I always think of like, well, what is my answer going to be when someone asks me that question, right? Um, I mean, we may not always agree, but, I'm supportive, right? And so then I look and I go, yep, there, there are things you can do better. And so I look and I think of this number, and it's like, what should we expect? And I think a net promoter score keeps coming to mind of like, what should we expect? And there are going to be people who are vocal, 
Mm -hmm. Right, and we talked at our last meeting about how I think it also breaks down by numbers by uh, ethnicity, which I think is an mm -hmm. interesting piece of information, uh, and where your support comes from. But so that, that's what I'm like wondering. It's like, so we say you partially. Right, so we can, we can pick something and, and work towards it, but it, even by choosing what we're measuring it by, we, we aren't certain that it actually is achieved, even if it hits that threshold. Right, because we're talking about something that's probably qualitative. Like, are we good at communications? What does that really mean? It's it's not it, you know we can count count the newsletters, talk about comments back and forth, and and it isn't necessarily, um, you know, it isn't necessarily you know it, as as blunt or as seemingly objective as as some of the other things that are that are strictly, you know, overtly qu uh, quantitative. Uh, I do want to point out, though, did you, some of your questions, Eric, it made me realize, like, this is the superintendent's goals, but these are our goals, too, mm -hmm. right? These, these are clearly our goals. This, this, this presentation is labeled the superintendent's goals, and they are the superintendent's goals because we provided them to the superintendent to superintend and organize and, and lead the district in the direction that we provided. And so when it says partially achieved or not achieved, that is us partially achieving or not achieving something, too. Right, so it is our goal to give clear instruction, and and I hope that we do that, and then we we own the results collectively. Even though it says superintendent's results, they are our results as well. So, I guess maybe a final thought is that you know, and maybe what I say, and I kind of as I push about communications and marketing, and you know, it's maybe it's engagement, right? And it's an interesting mm -hmm. discussion, right? Of like, does that look and I go our community? It's like we've, we've got so much passion. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we, you know, it's like, how do we get more kids involved? How do we get more parents involved? I just keep thinking going, it's, it's on, to your point, Tim, it's on us to write, to, to cultivate the community, to get it going. And it's like, and I think it just, it kind of just steamrolls, right, where you get more people involved, more people showing up, more people participating and giving their opinion and hopefully helping to make it a positive environment for everybody. Right. Thanks. All right, thank you. Ms. Meshach, have we completed the math? <laughs> <laughs> Roughly. <laughs> Wonderful. My favorite kind. Um, but just to piggyback off this conversation, I think um, as we look at our goals as a board for next year, um, it's making me kind of excited to think about using data we have to really target what our goals are and maybe have like a primary focus as a board that we can each work towards and have individual goals towards that we can kind of like continuous improvement style keep looking back at um, because there are areas within here like you said that we all well all of them we all own so um, I'm looking forward to that conversation uh, my math I was a little alarmed by the drop in Asian graduation rates mm -hmm. between 2020 20 and 2021 um, I knew that our numbers weren't particularly high in that demographic so it looks like in a senior class, we'd have between 10, or 10 to 15 Asian students, so that number can fluctuate quickly. Cool. Even so, I think 30% is still worth mm -hmm. looking into. Um, and then the other category that caught my eye was the English learner. Um, so I was wondering if we know why those grad rates drop by 10%, because that's probably more 40 to 50 students per, per class. Mm -hmm. And if not, what we might be able to do to collect more information on that. Um, informally, we know that the couple of years of COVID um, disproportionately impacted certain populations. Um, and in ELL families, um, we provided as much support as we could figure out, um, but it clearly was not as effective over those couple of years. Um, and so uh, that is what we have initially um, recognized. And then obviously, we're going to continue to study to make sure that this doesn't have like four years yeah. of impact. Because okay. But overall, I was really um, happy with the achievement measures um, and that data. So, um, thank you. Just, just for my own benefit, you were doing the math based on the, the demographics that are shared at the front of the presentation and estimating 200-ish graduates. Um, no, I went to the MDE report card, oh, which wow. is a great resource. Oh, wow. okay. um, so we have these based on MDE categories. I mean, are, that our, our demographics are included in the packet on, I believe, page six. So, yeah, you know, you, a... you could have ballparked four and a half percent Asian Next and. Next time, that'll save it, me some clicks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wonderful. So, so I could learn something. I'll, I'll know where to look on the MDE report card.
if I want if I want to. All right, thank you. Okay. Any final call for questions or comments on the superintendent um, goals presentation? All right. Thank you. Well, that concludes the information and proposals non-action items and brings us to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is that basket of things that are deemed routine, but are, all, of course, all important. But we, but we consent to pass them without discussion. So before taking action on the item, I would pause and see if anyone has something from the consent agenda they wish to remove for more formal discussion. Hearing none, I could entertain a motion on the consent agenda. I'll move the consent agenda as presented. I'll second. Motion to approve by Ms. Bracke and second by Ms. Banks Kepcho. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. The chair votes aye. And the consent agenda is approved. We move now to old business, and we have a second read of policy 209, board self evaluation, and administrative guideline 209.1. All right, so we have been obviously very busy with graduation and everything, so there are only minor changes. Uh, there has not been a new draft of the evaluation, but we wanted to bring this back for a second read. Um, board self-evaluation and the process that the board will go through um, and the accompanying guidelines, um, which we did identify at our past meeting, was in need of some transformation. Um, and so this is one to probably bring back four times um, because I anticipate draft three will have a significant transformation of this. Um, and then we will bring it back again. Um, so this is just for a reminder to jog our memories that we are looking at an overhaul. All right. And Ms. Bracky is raising a hand. I am because I volunteered to do some of this work and I have not done it yet. So I am responsible for that. Um, Rachel's gonna help. I think Allegra has some ideas as well. So I think it's, um, if we have the gift of some time, we will be able to do the overhaul work over the course of this summer. Um, is there a requirement for when board self-evaluations have to happen? Because I will admit, I also had the like reflection as I was thinking about this. Summer's a really strange time in some ways for the board to do its self-evaluation because two of you have been on the board for five minutes. Months. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense from like a school year point of view and alignment with the superintendent goals and evaluation, but it doesn't really make sense as far as like our terms, which start in January of a given year. Um, so my question is, is there a specific time window that so we There are? is no statutory or actual requirement okay. that you even self-evaluate yourself. Okay. Um, so it would, it would make sense to, I'd say gently reflect over the summer on how you have all fulfilled your board roles. Gently How's reflect. that? <laughs> thank you, thank you. And then uh, rewrite this in time for goals, uh, because part of this is the goal writing process for next year um, to align. Um, your goal writing process? Uh, my goal writing, your goal writing process, board member goal writing process. Okay. Um, and so at the end of the, at least the current self-evaluation is reflect on how I am as a board member, reflect how we are as a board, then goal setting for the future. And so if we did want to align that um, October-ish, November-ish, we could yeah. easily look at that as a good time frame to be setting goals okay. and in that conversation. Cool. It's also okay for ours to be iterative too. It is, and that's where it's like, you know, I'm not sure that this cycle is exactly right. Mm -hmm. So how to do it in a way that is more mm -hmm. flexible and responsive to how we do our work feels appealing. Well, you do have the power to change it in any yes. way you want to for Very draft three. Very empowering, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all up to you. All right. So we, we have lots to look forward to on policy 209 and the, I, I look forward to the update um, as it unfolds. And understanding that, that Ms. Bracke and team will, will take some time to, 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 I'm sure, deliver it thoughtfully. So that's great. While all of us gently reflect. While all of us gently reflect, but, but you will be you know, diligently writing or rewriting, I imagine, with, with support from Ms. banks Show and Ms. Smishek. And that's three, and the rest, you know, we can't do the rest of it. The rest of us are shut out for. Well, we wouldn't, because that would be breaking quorum. Correct, exactly. We, yeah. we, we, will, we can only have conversations um, when, when pointed to in public at, at a meeting like this, which is great. I, I have full trust in the team that's on it. I really do. So thank you. And gratitude, too. And gratitude. Because I will. Yes. We, we, we only punish the volunteers, is, is what we've learned in life. 
<laughs> so thank you. Um, that brings us to then the policy 102 equal education opportunity, also a second read, I believe. Correct, and we have updated this one um, with the new updates from MSBA. Uh, just a reminder that we ensure educational, equal educational opportunity for all students. Um, we prohibit harassment and discrimination based on any form of protective classifications. It refers to policy 103 har harassment prohibition, uh, makes clear statement about pro prohibiting discrimination of students with a disability, um, and then also prohibiting sexual harassment discrimination or harassment and discrimination of any kind. Uh, just updating that um, with some of the policies uh, that have been updated and laws that have been updated. And so you'll see those changes in your board packet today uh, for the second read. Thank you. Does anyone have questions or comments about the, the provided uh, red line changes for policy 102? Sorry, one, yeah, 102. Well, then we'll bring that one back, um, I imagine, next time for a third read and possible passing. Absolutely. Okay. And then the next item we have is Policy 101, Strategic Plan and Administrative Guideline 101.1. All right, so um, strategic plan, and so updated already um, with a lot of the style guide components, um, changing um, basically page one um, of the policy itself is style guide, and then obviously, which we had already done, integrating the newer 21-26 strategic plan into the guidelines of the policy. Um, and so this is for second read, um, and it's just making sure, again, it's up to date and up with our style guide. Thank you. And so just to be clear, the, the actual strategic plan that we're calling the guideline, is that right? Uh, correct. Okay. It, it does not is appear it, clear to me that it's labeled as such. Guide? Let me double check. Perhaps and perhaps I misspoke. Let yeah. me be my problem for how the, the, the size of screen that I've uh, administrative guideline 101.1 um, and I don't believe there is a title page that is calling it okay. the guideline. I think you are correct okay. all right so we will add something to note that the strategic plan in here is 101.1 guideline excellent um, does anyone else have questions or, or, or more substantive than what I raised about uh, policy 101 well, then we look forward to, to that one also coming back for a third read at the next at the next meeting. Okay. That brings us to new business, and first out of the gate is 2022-23 final budget. And Mr. Holgi is. 101. Uh, that, that was strategic plan. Yes. Wow. It was. Never mind. I missed right. it. <laughs> it was a blink. Thank Mr. Holgi has 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 found his, his, one of his, his comfort spots right there at the <laughs> microphone in front of us to talk about the, the proposed adopted budget. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, and we have for your approval tonight the 22-23 adopted budget, also referred to as the fiscal year 23 um, budget. Um, we're going to pop in a little bit into this packet to the board presentation side of it or the PowerPoint that's included in here because it will summarize all the information that's included and we'll go through that in sections here. So. Um, as we look out today, when we go through this, we will take a look at the current year, fiscal year 22 budget update, looking at our March 31 data, um, highlight a few items, and then talk about what the revised budget fund balance projections were. And then we'll move into the proposed budget for fiscal year 23, um, discussing some of the assumptions, the fund balance projections, and the considerations. <coughs> So as we move on to this slide, sorry, these are lots of really small numbers, but you can all pull it up individually. Just a couple of things to highlight. The blue arrow, um, this is looking at our federal revenue. And so as we know, we have um, COVID funds that are um, being used this year and planned for use next year, um, as well as has been received over the last couple of years. So you'll see that in June of 20, that fiscal year 20, we had about $2.8 million in federal funds. You can see that popped up to $4.8 million last year audited. This year we're planning for about $7 million. And um, then next year we also will have some COVID funds that are being um, spent and revenue that's being received. Um, that eventually will be going away because that is one-time funding. So we just are looking at planning for that as we move forward. But that increased from $2.8 million up to $7 million this year for fiscal year 22 is indicative of those COVID funds and some of the different ways that we've been realizing revenue for our work. Um, overall, you can see with our current budget, um, we're projected to have about a $72.7 million 
um, revenue coming in up a little bit from the current year by about a million dollars and most of that was in those federal programs um, actually sorry I'm gonna step back in revenue some of those things are also time sensitive and so even though it says 72.7 .7 million dollars that likely isn't going to be that full amount at the end of the year um, because the projections are looking at historical modeling and some of these things we receive at different times and so it's not always fully articulated there um, when we look at expenditures just that green arrow is highlighting the combination of salaries and wages and employee benefits you can see salaries and wages are um, looking to be a little bit lower in how that's being spent over time um, when we look at the previous year modeling benefits are going to be a little bit higher but generally those are going to be roughly flat there so fairly even with our um, expenditures coming in here at the end of the year as well and then when we look at the expenditures by program you can see one of the things that are offset in this with purchase services and equipment um, is our facilities and so facilities is time sensitive as we talked about in the revised budget um, so we had more projects that were completed at the end of last summer beginning of this fiscal year so those rolled in um, and that likely won't be the full eight million dollars spent at the end of the year um, when we look at the other budgets the current year um, the red arrow here is highlighting our food service you can see that that revenue has um, continued to be increasing um, still relatively consistent where we were projecting the budget to end and then that overall spending variance at the very bottom blue arrow um, is indicative of an 8.4 million dollar projected end of year reduction similar to the 8.8 .8 million which is in the revised budget as we've talked about much of that is going to be sitting in our facilities work in that construction fund specifically so um, as far as the revenues that are in there are a lot less than what the expenditures are moving on to the next slide just to highlight we are on track as of May 31st 2022 our fiscal year ends June 30th um, and we have already started some of the audit work that's a part of that process um, and we highlighted that federal funds the revenue expenditures are primarily one time over a series of years the salaries and benefits we summarized are um, relatively consistent with where our revised budget is and that facilities and capital purchase timing is off um, a little bit and changes some of those projections on um, nutrition services and construction so just highlighting what I referred to in the first few slides uh, moving on to the fund balance um, and this is mostly just a reminder of what the board approved earlier this spring um, we are in this um, fund balance on the revised budget projecting a 15 million dollar or 15 percent um, projected unassigned fund balance um, we see the green arrow is a reduction in our long-term facilities maintenance again those are those construction projects and some of the timing around that um, the blue arrow just highlights one of the things that we've been doing with COVID. Um, because we've had some ALC and summer programming only, we've been able to build up that reserve for our area learning center, which includes our targeted services and our summer school programming. So we can sustain that programming that we've been adding um, for a little bit longer after COVID funds run out. Um, at the bottom of this, um, there is an assigned um, COVID account um, this is an articulated reserve where we've been um, using COVID to sustain some of our programming as far as our class sizes that we otherwise would be having to reduce and so we've been building up that reserve for that assigned COVID knowing that that's going to be one of the areas that we are intentionally spending down and using that to sustain our programming after COVID funds run out um, and then overall in our current revised um, fund balance we have an overall general increase of just over four hundred thousand dollars all historical stuff that you've approved and seen in the past but just kind of gives context as we move forward um, the next slide is those other funds um, highlights here is the total construction fund this as you heard earlier in the presentation is a project that now is nearing completion and so we are um, reducing that reserve um, which was fund funded by bonds by 7.5 million dollars which basically ends that with a zero construction fund at the end of this year um, our health insurance the internal service fund 20 is one that we continue to watch as we've seen our insurance utilization increase um, both because of COVID as well as increased incidents and so that's something that we're monitoring as we move forward but are projecting about a 1.1 million spend down of our fund balance in that reserve account this year and then finally that total of funds we mentioned was the 8.8 .8 million dollars um, 
deficit spending in those areas, and primarily that was the construction um, that we talked about earlier. Um, so as we move into next year, um, the fiscal year 23, it should say at the top of this, I missed that title, um, budget considerations. Um, we have um, received information in the previous um, funding from the legislature. We have a 2% increase in the formula allowance, so we've factored that in. We're also projecting an 80 student reduction in average daily membership. That is looking at modeling on a number of different ways where we look at a couple different strategies that way. Combined both district um, direct student enrollment as well as we're a fiscal host for part of the 287 South Education Center program and so some of the projected reductions in there. Um, a reminder, our fund balance policy, we have a board approved fund balance policy that targets four to 10% um, for an unassigned fund balance. When we're at the eight to 10%, we are looking at ways to improve programming and increase um, resources as necessary when available, as well as maintaining sustainability. When we're at six to 8%, we start to limit the deficit spending, so we phase back and start to reduce that so that we're not adding programs. Um, and try to balance that out. And then when we hit four to six percent fund balance, we're more about maintaining um, the fund balance or increasing it at that point um, through either revenue increases or through um, program reductions. And if we hit four percent, then we are more extreme on our um, strategies of improving referendum, or improving revenue through um, referendums or things like that, or making significant budget reductions to make sure that we aren't um, deficit spending at all. Um, we also look at our ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 funds over the next two years. Um, we've been using that to maintain current programming and staffing levels. So where if we didn't have those COVID funds, we would be reducing class sizes at this point. Um, and so that's one of the things that we heard when we did a survey earlier this fall, that we um, class sizes were important to people, that that's one of the areas that we've been maintaining programming and staffing levels. We've also been using that to maintain programming supported by compensatory funds. And this showcases just how the school district compensatory funds have gone down mm -hmm. over the last series of years. From our current fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 23, we're projecting just under a $400,000 reduction in compensatory funds. That's on top of, or that um, reduction was 1.4 million or almost 1.5 million from the fiscal year 20 to next year's funding level. And then when we go back even one more year further from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 23, we have $2.1 million less in compensatory funds than we were receiving in fiscal year 19 that we are will be receiving next year. Those are set dollars based on enrollment in this current fiscal year 22 and based on our free and reduced um, uh, population and eligibility factors that way. So that $2.1 million has been, um, the programming that was supported with that um, has been maintained through some of those ESSER and COVID funds specifically. Um, the next slide we'll be talking about some program additions and then as I mentioned, sustainability has also been a large factor. Um, before we jump into these budget considerations, I do want to kind of highlight how our budget planning has been different this year and well informed by a number of different stakeholders. So if you remember last fall in August and September, we did a specific community-wide survey with our parents, with our students, with our staff about how they wanted ESSER funds to be used and what programming additions were important to them or what was connected in that way. That's where we heard about class sizes. That's where we heard about social emotional learning and student engagement activities. Um, and so there was a number of different findings or pieces of information that came out of that that we've been reflecting back on all throughout the year. Um, we also asked our administrators and had a number of different surveys that occurred during the year for program additions and other program opportunities, as well as is there anything that we should be reducing. Um, so community input, staff input as part of that, reflecting on the strategic plan, looking for alignment in where we're making these program additions, um, how COVID funds can be used. Um, throughout the year, we've had opportunities to share the information with Fiscal Planning Advisory Committee as well and given feedback on kind of our long-term planning about are we spending down, are we holding reserves, where do we make investments and things like that and have reviewed that with members of that group. Um, and really all throughout, one of the things that was interesting is we looked for alignment in all of those different areas. So it wasn't just, oh, this one person said it, then we looked back at what was the community saying and what did our staff say and what is fiscal planning's perspective and how does this line up with our strategic plan. So much more 
integrated behind the scenes in reflecting on those different pieces as we built this. So, and then we also have maintained current staffing ratios um, as a balance of kind of a neutral budget. So we didn't increase class sizes, um, but we've been maintained those class sizes and then also looked at energy costs as another thing that we know is going up. And so we built in some assumptions in those areas specifically in addition to just normal inflationary increases. So what's that mean? Um, additional programming beyond kind of what our core program has been. Um, we've um, supported class size reductions and balancing those class sizes. Um, in this current budget, we have an additional five FTEs that have been built into this for elementary classes that are kind of on the cusp of where we would be adding um, or where they would be kind of fitting within the area. So our higher class sizes at the elementary, we built in five additional positions specifically where we were seeing some of those um, borderline classes that would have been at the higher level. Um, the next bullet, the student engagement support. We also added two positions, one at the middle school and one at the high school for student engagement support, um, as well as looked at how do we do programming and building out programming that way to make sure that um, where we have students who are entering school and maybe needing some additional supports to kind of work through the day and being able to focus on their instruction um, and maybe do some, doing some reteaching on how do we re-enter the schools and how do we re-enter classrooms after COVID. Um, so programming there, instructional support. We also added um, an interventionist, which provides um, intervention support for reading and math at each one of our elementary buildings on top of the intervention work that we are already providing with um, ADSYS and our title <coughs> programs. Um, so we added four additional positions there. And then engagement and outreach. Um, we added connect and assess days for all of our elementary staff um, and students to be meeting with parents and families and students um, before school starts at the beginning of next school year. Um, we add an additional day for all of our teachers um, using our summer programming dollars um, from ESSER and COVID. Um, and then the high school will be um, also, or the high school and middle school will have an additional day for professional development and planning, which was something that they, we heard that they were wanting more throughout the year as well. So um, added a day for all of our teachers um, for additional supports and or connections with kids. And then we're gonna continue to evaluate the needs and sustainability throughout the year as well. So the proposed budget, this highlights dollar amounts. Um, uh, the red, you can see there's a proposed or a anticipated reduction in our state revenue of about 168,000. That is gonna be um, inclusive of both the formula increase as well as the projected reduction in enrollment. Um, our federal dollars, um, 985,000, that's gonna be primarily additional COVID dollars um, that are being realized and planned in addition to our federal dollars in those areas. Um, property taxes, it looks like it's going up by 907,000, but I wanna remind you of the work that we did in December, where we talked about the negative adjustments that occurred for the fiscal year 22 budget, because we had enrollment, we had projected enrollment higher than what realized, and so there was a negative reduction made for the property taxes in our fiscal year 22 levy. Um, that now went back up because those adjustments came off the books. Um, and so most of that increase is associated with that, as well as some increased property values and things like that with our capital projects technology levy. Um, but that big reduction, and again, I said this earlier, our homeowners are paying less, even with increased values, than the, on average than what they were paying about four years ago. <laughs> um, so it, we talked about that in December, but I just don't want that sticker shock of 907,000 thinking all of a sudden our property taxes are going up. Really, it's been relatively flat from over the last four years beyond that reduction last year. Um, so overall, revenue projected increase about $1.6 million. Um, in the expenditure series, again, salaries and wages and employee benefits you can see are the two largest categories for our increases in expenditures tied in with that staffing that I referenced earlier, as well as inflationary increases in some of the contract settlements and things like that. Um, there's a $504,000 reduction in equipment. Some of that is our um, equipment purchases, but that also is gonna include technology that was able to be purchased in our current fiscal year um, that won't need to be purchased next year because of some of the COVID funds and how they've been realized. So there's a reduction there, but that's also connected in with that. 
and um, technology specifically is looking at starting to build up a reserve for an infrastructure project that they're projecting in the future. Um, so that's kind of a highlight of that area. So net, our expenditures are projected to increase about $3 million. Um, on the next slide, um, when we look at my program series, again, just to highlight here, you can see projected increase of about $1.7 million in regular instruction, $1.1 million in special education instruction. Those are the two highest categories for increases, again, tied in with that staffing that we referenced. Um, instructional support is going to include reductions in technology um, because technology falls under that instructional support category. Um, the $337,000 in pupil support is primarily around transportation and some in projected increase in contracted transportation costs um, in that pupil support area. And then you can see facilities also has a reduction of $284,000 in this current proposed budget. Um, and then there's that same $3 million expenditure. When we look at the next slide um, and some of our other programs, the food service, $311,000 projected reduction in revenue and a $300,000 reduction in expenditures. A reminder, our free lunch program that's been federally funded ends as of June 30th. And so we're projecting that there will likely be less participation in that area. Um, so less revenue coming in as well as less expenditures that would be offset with those meal programs. Um, the debt service you can see is an offsetting about $2 million on each side of that. That was connected with a bond refunding that occurred in fiscal year 22. That is not occurring in fiscal year 23. And then the blue arrow in that bottom section, the construction fund, I mentioned that before, but that will be very few dollars that are spent in next fiscal year associated with that. Summary, um, overall, a net reduction of our overall total district fund balance of $4.7 million, um, $7 million of expenditures coming in that um, construction budget primarily as well. So um, moving on to the fiscal year 23 fund balances, just some things to highlight. Um, there's a 10.808% projected fund balance in our unassigned fund balance for next year. Um, you'll notice at the far left of that, it says 13% projected fund balance at the end of current year, fiscal year 22. You may be wondering what happened to that 15% that you told me earlier in this presentation that's now 13%. Um, because we are planning to deficit spend in our general fund balance, we have to assign a fund balance for the subsequent year budget. So that is brought down lower in this sheet. So our unassigned fund balance is projected to um, decrease by $2.2 million. Um, if you move to the bottom of this slide under the assigned funds, um, the green arrow is highlighting that $1,095,000 um, that is the same as the $1,095,000 in the blue, blue arrow. So that is our total deficit spending in our um, general fund for next year. Um, and so that $1,095,000 plus the $9,786,000 at the top comes up to that 15% that we referenced before. It's just a moving down of something the auditors are going to make us do. Um, and then I also referenced kind of that increase in the COVID fund balance, assigned a fund balance for that sustainability that we will intentionally spend down once the COVID funds have expired. Um, so we have probably about one year's worth of sustainability after COVID goes away, put aside in that account specifically. Um, in the other funds, um, you can see the food service is relatively flat or relatively even. Um, the green arrow is the internal service fund that we continue to watch. And that overall fund balance um, reduction program-wide or organization-wide is $1.7 million. So the next slide highlights most of that. Um, current projection 7.5 million or 10.08% unassigned fund balance. Um, it's, we have the 6% before we start reducing programming. So we talked about the projected fund, the fund balance policy. Um, down from that 15.36%, increase of assigned fund balance for COVID, and then overall decrease of the general fund of 1095000 And um, just as we look at that sustainability, I like to plan a couple years in advance. Um, and so we will be moving forward this year and starting to plan that five-year long-term planning for we get through fiscal year 23. We've got about $4 million that we've been set aside for some sustainability 
but that following year we'll likely be making some really significant reductions or having to be look at other opportunities for um, revenue depending on what happens with the state legislature depending on you know a number of different things and then we also have the um, capital projects technology referendum which has to be renewed and approved by voters um, in fiscal year in November of 2023 or that money is not available moving forward and again that's about four million dollars of revenue for the school district a lot of information a lot of numbers out there um, we do need a budget to be approved before the end of June but if there's questions um, hopefully you understand kind of what's gone into the planning around this you heard a little bit of information back in May when we did the proposed budget um, but I'll pause and answer any questions that you have all right thank you mr. Holgey um, I will offer it to the board I will start on the right mr. Carter want to go first surprisingly I have no questions but thank you for the presentation and all the data <laughs> Ms. Banks sculpture do you have questions or comments? Craig, I'm just so glad you are in this position because your eyes literally twinkle when you're talking <laughs> spreadsheets and numbers and just nerding out to the nth degree. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm nerding out. Okay, good. Right. That's a compliment. Me and Tim. Me and Tim are nerding That's a good out thing. spreadsheets. That's, I hear it's a good thing. <laughs> Ms. Meshack, questions or comments? Um, I was just wondering if you could highlight a few areas where our budget is really supporting our strategic plan. Um, you kind of mentioned some, but I was thinking of like that director of extended learning position that we funded this year. Like, budgets are moral documents and they're also strategic documents. So, sir. Um, yeah, so what, what I found interesting, and it, like, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that pulled up right in front of me, but. Um, Obviously, the staffing, the class sizes, the individual focus on kids, the connection, the relationships is a critical part of it. The additional learning opportunities for kids, like you talked about, the director of learning was built into this piece. Um, we also have had significant increases in our summer programming. Um, as you heard earlier, um, we have not just our only traditional targeted services, but we've got a lot of enrichment programming that's been built into this um, budget specifically. Um, fortunately, using many of those federal funds that have come through COVID. And um, just for perspective, um, prior to COVID, we had 14 different um, federal grant programs or grant programs that were managed, you know, and Mary and her department, you know, have tremendous connections just maintaining our title program and just maintaining our special ed programming. COVID added another 14 grant funded programs that all come with individual restrictions and requirements and so one of the things that we've learned within the district office is to really partner and work hand in hand finance and special programs and TNL and kind of build in all of these different connections and look for how do we access those resources to the best benefit of kids um, that align with our strategic plan that align with what we're hearing on an annual basis um, that aligned with that survey that we did at the end of the year which does um, a really good check-in on where we're at and even how things change since we were doing strategic planning because i think some of those things that when you're doing strategic planning you're focused on one piece and then all of a sudden you're two years into COVID and you realize things have been disrupted more than what you even thought about and so keeping it real time in the budget planning has been critical um, but really, I know, I'm, okay, I'm gonna get soapboxy. <laughs> Parents and kids and teachers want connections, you know? And so you see the student engagement, you see the maintaining lower class sizes, you see that part of it built into the budget and some of the positions that we're adding so we can focus on that, so we don't have to worry about kind of maintaining it. Um, we added Premier Reserve teachers this previous year. Um, which were away so we had individuals who were in buildings that knew kids that even though it didn't solve every sub absence issue it made it easier because that adult already knew kids and they saw that person's face in the classroom on a daily basis or in the school on a daily basis and so that connection was also part of it um, expanding programming like we talked about summer programming um, enhancing that with work that we were already doing with beacons and already doing with our community education programming and looking at innovative ways it's kind of allowed us to jumpstart that work 
Um, and you see examples of that um, through the summer programming and the increase in federal funds for those things specifically and the expenditures related to that. So I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't go through item A, <coughs> item B, item C because to Rachel's perspective, there's a lot of words in the strategic <laughs> plan <laughs> and in slides and stuff like that. But it's kind of the guiding principles. You know, how do we make sure that the programming and instruction the kids are getting is there, but it's also supported by relationships, it's supported by training, it's supported by connections and helping our staff work with our kids and build that connection with families too. Appreciate that. Thank you. Right, Ms. Brocky, questions or comments? Um, I shared a lot of Electra's questions. I appreciated that. Um, it feels like a responsible budget given the math and given the numbers that we know and that you know way better than I do. Um, I think, uh, like, obviously I'm glad and not surprised that you're already thinking ahead to a year from now, two years from now. Um, I'm just really concerned about that looming cliff, mm -hmm. um, of the ESSER money, of the compensatory dollars. Maybe compensatory will come a little bit back, um, now that kids and families are being forced to fill out forms again, which I am deeply upset and angry about, but uh, there could be a little bit of money that comes back due to that. But I think um, my question is less a budgetary one and more a communications one, which is like, how are we going to let other people know, primarily our staff, our families, our community, that like, this is down the road and we actually want to start talking about it now so that there are not surprises and shock because we know people do fixate on things like class sizes and that sounds disparaging because I struggle with class sizes given what the research actually says about <laughs> class size being um, predictive of student growth um, but I, I think that's where my concern is coming in it's not about this budget it's about what's happening down the road and the degree to which we're preparing people for it um, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think that starting the conversation with the board so that we can kind of be mutually informed on yeah. goals and efforts and desired programming and when we make decisions and when we make um, take action um, regarding those requests. Um, obviously advocating at the legislature. Um, there was a time uh, seven years ago and prior where we were running on a 4% fund mm -hmm. balance every year. And so we would add and then we would cut, and then we'd cut, and then we'd cut, and then we'd go back and ask for money, and then we'd add, and then we'd cut, and we'd cut, and we'd cut. In the last, tech, in the last um, operating referendum, we made the commitment that we weren't gonna do that. Mm -hmm. um, we have, because of COVID, honestly, sustained that beyond where we had originally projected. You know, we thought it's, you know, four to five years, and then we'll start, you know, we'll build up for four to five years, and then we'll start spending down. So we've made it a few more years because of COVID, and we've been able to add programming even because of COVID dollars and federal programs. So kind of like our insurance program though, I think people have gotten spoiled mm -hmm. um, because we haven't been making reductions and that's where we need to figure out how do we intersect, how do we engage, how do we broaden that connection so that people understand where that's gonna be. Um, I think as we built the budget, some of the pieces is because we've been responsive and we've built things that people have been asking for with student engagement specialists and additional counseling support and a number of things that we've added over the last few years. We're gonna get into the situation of, okay, these, these are things that people have wanted, they're enhanced programming. Um, in general, I feel like people have really appreciated the programming that's been added, but we're gonna have to figure out what does that mean um, and how do we use the funds to do planning with the idea that we might be not using as much of those funds in the future, but we've, um, so for example, the summer school programming, adding things knowing that we've got an acute need right now because of COVID, and then figuring out how do we do things differently because staffing isn't always there, because the revenue isn't always there, and so being intentional about evaluating what works, what doesn't work, and where the true intersection of opportunity is, for some of those extended programming outside of the classroom. So. 
That didn't answer your question. <laughs> no. You can tell it's been <laughs> driving in my mind. And You're honestly, working through it. <laughs> honestly, it's been driving in my mind for the last four or five yeah. years yeah. of how do we manage that. We talk about it at FPAC basically every time of, you know, yeah. we got to start planning. We've seen our fund balance grow strategically in part by opportunity. Um, but we have to figure out what that message is. And I yeah. think we might want to spend some time planning on, okay, what are our key times and with upcoming elections and when would be the times to be proposing and taking action and communicating as well as partnering with the legislature on where there's additional funding beyond just local taxpayer impact. Yeah, and I agree that us talking about it here is important and I think it's when do we start and mm -hmm. how quickly can we yep. start broadening the circle of yep. who we're having the conversations with. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ms. Cole? Uh, thank you, Craig. This is uh, my eyes don't twinkle, but I'm very excited <laughs> in the color coding uh, of the arrows. <laughs> Uh, is, is uh, you know, I always say you can, t uh, you know, we can tell that you were a teacher. Uh, you have all of the tricks. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be, I, I, I have the sense that all of these preparations for the two years after this funding have been in, in your mind and in the collective, these, you know, minds of the administration. Uh, so I feel confident that you know, I don't, I don't, it's going to be hard, but it will be done, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like, it will be done appropriately uh, from the fiscal perspective, uh, but there's a lot of variables out there. Mm -hmm. There's like the election in November, uh, what's happening in the state, what's happening, uh, there's a working group and compensatory funding, trying to move away from using uh, free and reduced as a way to you know, account for poverty levels So, hope at the legislature, so hopefully something happens about that too. So I I think we just wait and see for a few months. At, at, I think until December, we're not gonna know much. Uh, at least like what exactly is going to happen because there's there's funding for special ed on the table, I, hopefully, right? There's funding for uh, English learners. So, and it's, it's, it's like, it feels like a lottery right now. It's like, what, what is really going to happen? We don't know. So, just thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hosey. I do not have any questions. I, I do appreciate the clarity of the presentation and, and appreciate the things that you've added to make it ever more clear to follow. So, thank you for all that. Um, you're, you're looking for for a motion on this, correct? I am. So, please. So, unless we want to come back for another. Unless we would like to come back for an unscheduled <laughs> emergency meeting, because at this stage it would need to be an emergency meeting. Which we would be willing to do. Which we, of course we would, if, if if board members had reservations. Um, so, with that, if anyone has has reservations they wish to state, please feel free to state them. Otherwise, we could entertain a motion to approve the budget as presented. I will move we approve the 2022-2023 budget as presented. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Brackey and a second by Mr. Carter. Any final discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Chair votes aye. And the 2022-2023 final budget is approved as presented. Congratulations, Mr. Holgey. Thank you. We move now to miscellaneous pay rates. Mr. Holgey stays on task with a, after a, a deep sigh. Yeah. So, very good. Thank you very much. Um, so we have for you this evening proposed miscellaneous pay rates for 2022-2023. Or 2022-2023. Um, this um, set of pay rates represent individuals that are not kind of um, organized in any one of our bargaining groups, and not necessarily they're more smaller or fewer individual positions that are connected in with these. So. Um, in general, you're seeing a proposed increase of about two percent for the school registered nurse, student engagement specialist, American Indian coordinator, Safe Routes to Schools coordinator, health resource coordinator, and our translation engagement coordinator, um, each increasing by about 2%. Um, there are a number of different changes within the community education. Um, basically, we work with our community education department on an annual basis and look at what's the market rates, um, what's the difficulty in filling areas. In addition to bus drivers, 
Lifeguards is one of those areas, and some of the water safety positions are areas that have been become more and more increasingly difficult to fill. Um, community education runs in more of a range of pays within different positions. Um, community ed instructors, for example, you see runs from $18.50 to $35. Much of that is driven by the enrollment of different classes. Much of it's driven by kind of the competitiveness between different programs for those different positions, like technology versus, I'm not going to throw out other names. So. Um, so that's there, and then similarly with the activities and athletics, just kind of what's kind of standard rates for some of those um, event positions um, and event workers and things like that. So most of our um, substitute employees, they're included in this, um, but our classified groups are food service paraprofessional um, and then facilities and transportation, and they're driven by um, the contract rate, starting rate within each one of the um, bargaining groups just as a separate for those positions which so just references that here so with that we're asking your for your approval for the miscellaneous pay rates for 20, 2022 and 2023 thank you mr. Hoji um, I'll open the floor to questions if anyone has them mr. Carter is making eyes at me he must have something to say I have an easy one I think it, um, is there a clear way to tell whether it's a per hour rate or it's a per event rate? Um, I'm assuming some are per event. Yeah, um, they are. Otherwise, you want to operate the clock at the track meets, Mr. Carter. No, I was just thinking security worker two. <laughs> okay, security worker two. There you go. Yeah. So, so the e the event specific ones, the site managers, the clock announcers, things like that, those are per event rates. Um, some of those you can see are varied based on what exactly they're doing. Um, honestly, activities knows which ones these are and which ones they aren't with the different uh, clock announcers. The sound and light is a per hour basis. Most of those are connected with our rentals of our auditoriums. Um, and so dance recitals and different programs and things like that. So most of those are connected in with the fee for service for renting out those different areas as well. Um, the board production, video production is a per hour rate. Um, so maybe it's a point of feedback then. I mean, it, uh, we do a pretty good job of publishing this stuff. And it's like taken out of context. So it's like, what does this mean, right? Yep. Uh, it might not hurt to put like per hour or per yep. event or, yep. or even group it by sections of this group is per event. So yep. Otherwise, again, I, if you're hiring for a security worker too, because I told you earlier I wanted a job, um, that, that's what I want to do. Understand. I, I have the same question, actually, about okay. which, good. One, which so ones were per event and which ones. That's good feedback. Yeah. We'll work to add it. Okay. Um, quite honestly, a lot of these become internal working documents, and so it's just referenced that way, but it's a good point of feedback. Um, the one thing I was just going to share is a, a note of appreciation just for our historical approach, which is to do 2% increases really consistently across roles in the district. I think it's predictable. I think it's helpful. I think it lowers the volume and intensity around things like negotiations and coming to these agreements. And we know that that is not the case in a lot of places. And so I think just having this really steady, predictable approach is helpful for our staff and is helpful for us um, as a district. So I just wanted to say that. Yes. Any, any other questions or comments? And if there are none, um, we can entertain a motion on the miscellaneous pay rates as presented. I have motion. a question. Yes, let's go. Are we going to, uh, I wanted to read what you said, Eric and Tim. Is this something that we need to add the per hour per event thing right before it, like does it need to come back or does it, like what are we going to do? I would suggest that um, if the board is comfortable, you can approve them with the rates that are in place. I'll work to add the clarification for which ones are per event and which ones are per hour um, based on the practice. You know, quite honestly, that sheet has been in play for 15 years um, and it hasn't been asked. So we and, didn't notice before. Yeah. So, you know, it's. I have failed to notice many times. Yeah. So, just operationally, <laughs> operationally, it, Plus, we, we right. know what we're doing. So we're going to continue that employees. same trend, that same practice yeah. of what it was. Okay. We'll work in the clarification of which ones are per hour and which ones are per event um, to make sure that that's clear on what's published on those miscellaneous pay rates and what's referred to for those operational pieces. Okay. 
And then there, I, I will assume, please correct me if I'm wrong, that these, there are contracts for all of these positions where these things are clearly stated. So the employees themselves are very aware of these. In, the employees are very aware. Um, some of these clock announcers and things like that, some of them are current staff that pick this up as an added assignment. Um, oftentimes they're the same individuals that are doing it on a regular basis. Um, the, and it's articulated in what that is, so um, before they are accepting the position and stuff like that. Okay. Um, some of them are gonna show up as 1099s versus actual district employees, just how that's set up um, in the amount of volume that's going through. You got. All right, if we have no more questions or comments, we, um, if someone felt strongly, we could entertain a motion to approve the miscellaneous pay rates as presented. With the understanding, of course, that uh, the, the pr prior practice dictates which ones are per day and which ones are per hour. Motion to approve. A second. Mr. Carter has moved to approve. Ms. Cole has offered a second. Any final comments? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Chair votes aye. And the miscellaneous pay rates are approved. We move now to donations. And we have, we have a handful. Yeah, we have, I believe, four of them. Uh, Richfield High School Boys and Girls Golf Teams received a donation of $250 each from the Spartan Foundation. So thank you to the Spartan Foundation. Uh, Sheridan Hills Elementary received a donation of $45 through Charities Aid Foundation of America. Thank you, Charities Aid Foundation of America. Sheridan Hills Elementary received a donation of $34.41 from Great Lakes Reyes Bottling. So thank you to Great Lakes Reyes Bottling. And again, Sheridan Hills received a donation of $40 from Box Tops for Education. So thanks to Box Tops for Education. All right. Well, with that presentation, deep appreciation to everyone who's, who's, who's donated to our programs. Um, we're going to entertain a motion to accept the donations with gratitude. I will move to accept the donations with gratitude. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Banks Cupcho and a second by Ms. Smeshek. Any final discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. The chair votes aye, and the donations are accepted with gratitude. We move now to advanced planning. And the first up is a legislative update. And last I heard, the legislature was not in session. Yeah, I believe the sound effect is wah, wah. Sound <laughs> trombone. So we had, yes, we had high hopes for some form of agreement, high hopes for traction on special ed cross subsidy, um, high hopes on some form of support to schools, and we got nothing. Uh, so uh, we will look forward to the next legislative session, unless by some form of shock there is a special session, of which all indications are that that is not likely to occur. So... We did not plan for those things, which is good, um, but uh, those things also did not come through, which is bad. Right, that is, uh, right, it, it would have been one of, definitely in the category of very nice to have. So. Does anyone have additional comments on the legislative update? No? All right, um, we can move then to information and questions from the board. Ms. Cole, do you have any information or questions to share? Ms. Brocky, questions and info, info to share? Uh, there were two things I wanted to share. Um, one is I wanted to uh, just send out some appreciation for the graduation ceremonies. I know our last meeting, I think, was the same night as RCEP, and then the high school one was a few days later. But at both ceremonies, I was really moved by um, experiencing for the first time a truly bilingual graduation ceremony and that felt like a very important step for us as a district and as a community. And then also having our district's land acknowledgement read at both of those events was the first time that I um, had experienced that as well. And so it was, I think, a real moment of pride of seeing those things come together and uh, just knowing that it's gonna be the first of many. Um, and then the second thing is I just wanted to say thanks to the League of Women Voters and the superintendent. Um, last weekend they had a gathering here actually in this room and then um, Steve took them on a tour around the new building and it, it was really fun to see our new space through the eyes of people who had not been in it yet um, and to, to really celebrate all that has happened over the last few years and I think the pride that people in our community 
um, see and experience when they actually get to um, be in this space. And it just made me think about how do we keep doing that even more. So it was it was a great experience, and uh, I was just grateful that I was able to be there for it. That is that is neat. I I, I was part of the homecoming mm -hmm. building tour. Yep. And yeah, you were here, right? It was it was really a, a, a lot of fun to see yep. people who have not been in the buildings in a long time walk in with very wide eyes yep. and, and, and and exclaim how cool everything looked. So and as well as some things that were that were an unchanged that they really valued. So that was that was a lot of fun. Mr. Carter, do you have any information or, or questions? Not today. Ms. banks Gupjo, information, questions? Nothing. Ms. Mishak? Um, yes, I have one thing from the Ridgefield Human Rights Commission. They are looking um, to fill some youth commissioner vacancies. So I will be connecting with them and also with uh, Christina Gonzalez to get some ideas. But if anyone knows of youth who um, are interested in activism or human rights, please let me know um, and spread the word. What ages? high school typically okay but they're pretty open yeah. in that range I think. all right and is, and is that it that's it, it's a great offer if, if you if your young person that you have in mind is not aware that that is a really nice committee and, and a lot of interesting conversations go on so I was fortunate enough to be liaison for that for for a while um, I do have one thing and it actually it was, it was sparked as a reminder as part of the vision card and it relating to our our audit procedure. Um, as part of the annual audit, the the audit team reaches out to the board chair and the just as, as you know me specifically, asking if, if I had a level of comfort and understanding um, of, of of the controls we have, the information shared with us by the administration, and the transparency of our budget process and our finances. And while I had, of course, favorable things to say. Um, I, I did want to offer to other board members if you have anything that you feel the audit team needs to be aware of or questions you have about finances and, and audit, I can give you the contact info um, so that you can reach out directly. You don't have to screen those, those questions or concerns with me, although it might be fair to screen them with the administration um, and, and make sure that, that the audit team hears from you. But I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that as an opportunity. So they will, they're in the, Mr. Holty, they're in the process of kicked off the audit of the current fiscal year. And they come back sometime in a couple months and deliver, uh, you know, that, that nice bound book of, of the audit findings and their presentation and they share with us. But this is our opportunity to participate, albeit at a, you know, relatively high, high level. So that's all I have. Um, uh, future meeting dates. Our next meeting is July 11th at 7 p.m. right here in the boardroom. It is the only meeting we have scheduled for July, and therefore, it will have public comment available to members of the public. Following that, we have August 1st, 2022, 7 p.m., right here in the boardroom. Does anyone have any suggested future agenda items that they've not previously shared? All right. Hearing none, um, you're certainly always welcome to share those directly with the administration or, or with Laura uh, to, to get those on the agenda. But it is now 9:10. And I will adjourn this regular meeting. Have a good night, everyone.